Welcome also uh, to all of you folks uh, watching via the magic of the internet on YouTube. Uh, thank you very much, uh, former Vice President Gore, uh, for inventing the internet to make this possible. <laughs> I am Dave Kopel, the Research Director of the Independence Institute, and besides being Research Director of the Independence Institute, one of the other things I do is I'm an Associate Policy Analyst at the Cato Institute you in turn Washington. Up the turn up the sound? Uh, it's maxed. I mean, if, if you, you can put the mic closer to your mouth if you want. I just kept it low for him. You're, you, you're shorter than him, so it's fine. Do you mind if I pull it out and talk with it like that? Sure. Do what you want. Be we'll we'll do the Phil Donahue uh, uh, style. <laughs> Walk around the audience, ask about people's feelings. <laughs> so, um, I joined Cato in, in 1988 as a uh, as an associate policy analyst, uh, and so I was, uh, as a Cato person, delighted uh, when several years ago uh, Cato added to its permanent full-time in-house staff in Washington, D.C., uh, Patrick Michaels, a excellent and outstanding voice on climate policy issues. Uh, Patrick is currently, a, besides being a Cato, a distinguished senior fellow in the School of Public Policy at George Mason University. Uh, he was, the, I believe, the Virginia State Climatologist uh, before that, past president of the American Association of State Climatologists, program chair for the Committee on Applied Climatology of the American Meteorological Society and, and, at the, uh, and was at the University of Virginia as a research professor of, of environmental sciences for over 30 years. He is a contributing author and reviewer of the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, which was undeservedly awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2007. <laughs> and his writing has been published in uh, the major scientific journals such as Climate Research, Climate Change, Geophysical Research Letters, Journal of Climate, Nature, and Science, as well as in, in many uh, uh, mainstream media publications such as the Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, and so on. His uh, paper, uh, clim his paper uh, on one of his papers won Paper of the Year uh, award from the um, Association of American Geographers in 2004. He is truly one of the world's leading expert on climate change and related issues, and he's here uh, today because he is the editor and author of some of the uh, material in this excellent new book, which I urge all of you to buy: uh, Climate Coup. Global Warming's Invasion of Our Government and Our Lives, uh, talking about how not only the, the science of climate itself, but also how climate change has been used as a pretext and a very unjustifiable one uh, for massive uh, government intrusions into people's lifestyles far beyond what can possibly be justified on any scientific basis based on um, the actual facts about climate science. So with that, I'd uh, like to welcome uh, Patrick Michaels, a voice of sanity in a uh, climate world gone mad. <laughs> well, I just have uh, three words to say to you. Buy this book. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I'll see you. <laughs> All right, we're going to have some issues here that are going to be somewhat um, technical because we don't have a remote to move this thing around. But there, something that's happened uh, over the course of the last couple of decades, which is an issue, global climate change, has worked its way into aspects of our political life uh, that are just about every aspect you can imagine. We need it a vehicle, an overarching vehicle to allow something like that to happen. We need it to have things happen like our legislature to cede its power to the executive branch and to cede its power to the courts. This, uh, this is, concept is called the executive state and Roger Pallon, a scholar at Cato, wrote the first chapter in this book which is a stunning expose of how it started in the Roosevelt administration and has worked its way through today. Uh, to the point that if the president wanted to, he could sign an executive order with everything in it that was in the Waxman-Markey cap-and-trade bill and it would be upheld by the courts and it would be 
enforceable. That's how much freedom you have lost, and I have lost, over the years. Uh, this occurred in a political climate where the Congress, in, in the final analysis, wanted not to be responsible for cap and trade. And so what they really wanted to do was to, in fact, hand it off to the Environmental Protection Agency, which is in the executive branch. Because if you think about it, if those 60 senators would have voted to bring cap and trade to a vote, they would have been held responsible for shooting the American economy in the foot. They would much rather that it was just one person, the chief executive, the president. And judging from the 2010 election, you must admit the senators would not, would not be that happy to not have him around anyway. <laughs> so uh, that's precisely what happened. Now what bases all this stuff? Well, I'm going to demonstrate in a few minutes that the canon of science, the Bible, the peer-reviewed climate literature has gone bad. The bias is demonstrable, and it's very, very disturbing. Uh, <clears throat> I always worry when Defense Department analysts go to Congress and say X or Y is a new strategically important issue, because what they really mean is, I want more money because I'm going to threaten you with X or Y. <laughs> and so you will see that the Defense Department has now decided that global warming is a, quote, threat multiplier. And then we have the issues of trade, where there are people in Washington proposing tariffs on goods coming in from countries that emit more carbon dioxide than we like. Uh, <clears throat> And the impact of global warming, of course, is supposed to be very bad on the developing world and damage human health, and you know what it's like in the schools. That's what's in this book, okay? And that's why I say buy this book, because the, each one of the chapters uh, is very, very well done and very readable. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so how bad is it? How bad is it? On June 26, 2009, the House of Representatives at 7 p.m., on a Friday to make sure it stayed out of the weekend news cycle, passed the Waxman-Markey cap-and-trade bill by three votes. It required a 3% reduction in emissions below 2005 levels by 2012, 42% by 2030, and 83% by 2050. Now I'd just like to show you what they were requiring uh, in this bill. <laughs> this is the, these are the per capita emissions of carbon dioxide. This is 2005, their base year here. Well, it's about 19 tons of carbon dioxide that you are responsible on the average for emitting into the atmosphere, not counting your breathing, by the way. Uh, and the bill takes it down. This is the 2012 target. And then we go to 20, 30, and here's 2050. The per capita emissions allowed to the average American in 2050 under Waxman-Markey would be the ca per capita emissions of the average American in 1867. <laughs> now, this provided a great opportunity for Cato, the Cato people in Washington, including myself. Because you see, there's something known as the Cato moment on television, <laughs> and it is this. When you have your opponent praising this bill, and you say, well, Mr. So-and-so, that's all well and good. Could you precisely tell us what technology you would employ to allow Americans to have the per capita emissions of Americans two years after the end of the Civil War? And your opponent goes, that's the camera over there. Uh, uh, and Ed Crane calls up and says, he's that guy who runs Cato, great job, you got, you got the Cato moment. Well, <laughs> Waxman Markey is really, really good for Cato minutes. Now, uh, I am going to do something that I don't really like to do. I'm going to use the United Nations estimates for climate, global warming from their mid-range warming scenario, and we'll see later that they're wrong, but that shouldn't surprise you. Uh, according to them, if we did nothing, just consider, continued on the exponential increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide that we have, uh, the temperature would rise 1.58 degrees C between 1990 and 2050. Now, using their own model, uh, if, we, if the United States actually achieved Waxman Markey, but started it in the year 2000, in other words, got, got to the 1867 levels in 2000, and maintain that for 50 years. The amount of, that the planet would warm would be 1.54 degrees, or four hundredths of a degree less. 
Okay, I'm setting up a straw person. Remember, I do use, I work for a university. We don't have any more straw men. Uh, but, uh, the, uh, now, let's say, that is a straw person. So let's, let's say that all the nations of the world that have obligations under the Kyoto Protocol do this waxman marky thing. That's the U.S., Canada, Europe, Australia, not India, not China, but pretty much about all the rest of the developed world. And the amount of warming that you get by 2050 is 1.50 degrees C. So for all this economic effort, you uh, prevent eight hundredths of a degree Celsius of warming, which is an amount too small to measure with our current technology. So anyway, why is this? Why is, it so, why is this so bad? Well, a couple things are going on. Here's the United States emissions. This, this is the data, latest data from the, from the um, Energy Information Administration. The latest data they have only goes to 2009. Uh, and you can see our 2009 emissions of carbon dioxide, that's what these are, are now at the level that they were in 1995. Uh, <clears throat> at the same time, China passed us uh, around 2004, 2005, and their emissions are now 42% greater than ours. In fact, if we shot our emissions to zero, China would make up the difference in 10 years. So it's futile for all these policies to go forward. And we'll talk about the, what, the implications of uh, you know, leaking our jobs and, and industry to China and all that a few minutes from now. Anyway, why did ours go down? Well. Here's a graph that I really got to remove from this deck, okay? But I'm too lazy to do it. Uh, I'll just walk you through the important part. Per capita GDP went down, or GDP went down. So that your emissions go down because you're not producing as much. I know this is a shocker. Now, they went down 2.5%. Uh, how much do they have to go down to reduce emissions 83%? I don't know the answer to that, but I, I'm sure it's well into the double digits. And then there's something else here, which is our energy intensity became less. Now, what do I mean by that? That's the amount of carbon dioxide we use per unit energy emitted or per unit gross domestic product. And if you want to see where that happened in the various economic uh, areas, one, this is emissions intensity, and you can see it drops most in red, in the electric power region. What is the reason for this? Well, uh, let me tell you something. I've been getting kicked around for about 25 years by my greener friends because I have this idea that if you don't do anything about global warming, what will happen is you actually will do something about it because you will have money and you will invest that in technologies. And uh, if, you, you know, if you have a lot of money, you're going to invest it more than if the government takes it and invests in the uh, National Renewable Energy Laboratory of its choice <laughs> down the road. <coughs> that place produces absolutely nothing. Do you realize that? I mean, it, it, is, it is one of the most remarkable uh, tributes to Mussolini-like architecture <laughs> and energy savings in the United States. Anyway, so I go, I, I go around to people and say, oh, you're crazy. You're, you're, you're hoping for a miracle. I say, well, no, no, wait a minute. Uh, uh, let's look at the last 100 years. You know, If I said in 1911 that you know, in the next 100 years, somebody's going to uh, invent a new element. You know, you know the periodic table stops at uranium, right? No. We're going to invent a couple new ones, and one of them is called plutonium. And if we take about this much of it, uh, Denver blows up. <laughs> you know, and I say, you're crazy. I said, oh yeah, and if we divide it into little rods and stick it in water and it boils, we put electric lights, you know what those are, in the city of Denver for a hundred years. They'd say you're nuts, but that's the kind of thing that happens. So I want to give you two words to explain why this did that. Why our carbon emissions intensity dropped so much in electrical power. It's because of something that wasn't supposed to happen because it was all gone. And the word is, words are two, shale gas. Nobody anticipated 10 years ago that we would have essentially an infinite supply of this that was reachable. But that's what happens when you allow people to invest their money. And that's what doesn't happen when you don't and you throw it at solar energy and windmills down the road, okay? 